It, it's an absolute delight to be at this conference. This is my, my first time here. As Scott mentioned, I am a visiting fellow at Franciscan University. So it's, it's wonderful that those two paths, the, this conference and the work that I do at Franciscan, converge here. And I'm just very grateful to um, Scott and Kimberly for what they've built here and for allowing me to be a, a small part of it. So before I tell you my conversion story or, or share my witness, as it were, I want to put forward two caveats before you. The first is that my conversion is what's typically called an quote-unquote intellectual conversion. And it's true that books and, and ideas um, played a significant role in my decision, quite to my own surprise at the time in some ways, in 2016, to join the Catholic Church. But the danger or the temptation of such conversion stories is that they can sometimes uh, resemble a kind of act of heroic reading and thinking. You know, the, the protagonist of the story reads this book, and then they read a different book, and then he reads this third book, and they kind of clash, but then some synergy emerges out of the two, and it's all his own sort of heroic labor that ultimately opens the path to, uh, to Rome or across the Tiber. And so as I tell the story, you might hear some notes that sound like that, but what I'm asking you is to always remember that in all of these cases, it's, it's our Lord who is the primary actor, and the reading and the thinking and the ideas are responses to that invitation from above and not something that generates from below. And as you, you'll see that with some of the sort of accidental elements in my conversion story that couldn't have happened uh, but for what I believe were providential little nudges. And so just keep that in mind. The second thing is, obviously, as you probably read my name in the bio or heard it from Scott, it's a, it's a foreign-sounding name. And part of my story begins you know, across an ocean. Uh, and so there is a kind of exotic element to it. Uh, you know, there's this guy, his name is Sora. But what I want you to focus on is all the ways in which it's actually quite ordinary and mundane, not the things that are really, they're not the substance of the story, they're accidental elements of it. And so focus on the substance and you'll see that it's not so exotic and that therefore it can resonate with many people. Um, and that sort of touches also on this other fact, which is why am I standing before you? You know, it is perfectly legal, I don't think the church has dictated anything of the kind or issued any order that says that, you know, if you convert, you have to tell your story publicly. And, and I think you're, one is allowed, it's, it's perfectly permissible to just convert to Catholicism. So I'll tell you why in my case, and that kind of touches on the exoticism aspect as well, and then I'll get into the story proper. So when I was received into the church, uh, I was living in Europe. You'll get the actual details of why that is. And uh, while I had just begun the process of catechesis, it, something horrible happened in France. A, a priest by the name of Father Jacques Amel was murdered by a pair of jihadists uh, in, uh, in, Islam, uh, in, in France, but a pair of jih jihadists who identified with the Islamic State. And they beheaded him, uh, but, but not before he could uh, uh, yell out at his attackers, get away Satan. And he was doing this, this was done while he was celebrating the mass. And as I said, I was just beginning the process of catechesis. And I was obviously very shook by this story. I was very moved by it. And so I did what any millennial does. You know, I tweeted out uh, something like, you know, uh, I am Jacques Amel, which was actually modeled after the hashtag that emerged after the Islamist attack on the French satirical ma magazine Charlie Hebdo, and people started saying, je suis Charlie Hebdo. I said, I am, I am Father Amel. And oh, by the way, this is a good time as any to announce that I'm, I'm preparing to become a Roman Catholic. That tweet went absolutely you know, viral. Ten, tens of thousands of people liked it, thousands of people retweeted it, and then it made its way to Facebook. And 
you know, by the way, the response was overwhelmingly positive, save for a few of our evangelical friends who were like, beware the horror of Babylon. For the most part, <laughs> for the most part, people were very uh, receptive, but there was a misunderstanding. A lot of Catholic and Christian media picked up the story, and I, was, I already had a public profile as a, as a journalist for the Wall Street Journal at the time. And because they looked up my Wikipedia page and saw that I had been born in Iran, they interpreted it to mean that, you know, I had been a Muslim and a practicing Muslim five times a day, et cetera, and instantaneously this, this brutal act had converted me to Catholicism, and that none of that was true. You know, I, as you'll hear, I wasn't really Muslim or any sort of practicing Muslim or even a believer when I, when I began my journey toward the faith. Um, nor was I really, nor did I, as, as, as amazing as that story would have been if I had just been converted by this single uh, martyrdom, that would have been like a much more attractive story in some ways, but it just wasn't true. So I was compelled to tell the story of my conversion in part just to correct these misunderstandings that were proliferating at the speed of the internet. So, um, but I, there is an element of Islam in my story. There is an element of being born in the Middle East. I was born in Tehran, Iran uh, on, in 1985, February 1st, in fact, 1985, which was six years to the date that the Ayatollah Khomeini returned from his Parisian exile to herald the Islamic Revolution and usher away 2,500 years of Persian monarchy and establish the Islamic Republic. And the fact that I had been born on this uh, fateful anniversary was something of a running joke. Now here I start to get embarrassed because, because Scott had heard, has heard this probably more than once, so I apologize for giving a repeat, <laughs> Scott. Um, but the fact that I had been born on this anniversary was something of a running joke in our family. Most of my family had opposed the revolution save notably for my own immediate parents and, and my uh, maternal grandfather. And, but the rest of them had opposed it, and they were the kind of Iranian secularists uh, that you may be familiar with, or Middle Eastern secularists more broadly. And so for them, the date February 1st was uh, an odious name. And when I would uh, meet for family reunions with this particular relative, distant relative who had been a colonel, a police officer under the Shah, part of the security apparatus of the Shah, uh, he would always play this joke where he would ask my birthday, like, what's your birthday, Saurabh? And I knew that he knew that I knew that he knew the answer, but it, we would play, play along anyway. And so I would say February 1st, and he would hold his nose and say, like, piff, piff, you brought, you brought the imam with you, you brought Khomeini with you. Um, so that's the kind of milieu that I, I grew up in in Iran was largely secular, and the world that I lived in was really a dual world. There was the, the world behind closed doors, where I, you know, my parents were you know, quote-unquote intellectuals, my father was an architect, my mother was an abstract expressionist painter. I was sort of enveloped in our, this grand two-story house in central Iran, in central Tehran, with you know, Western books and, and bourgeois vibes. And, um, you know, my parents drank. Even my grandparents, my maternal grandparents who lived downstairs from us, they were fairly secular Muslims. They, you know, they, they, they believed, you know, and they did, they did their prayers, but they also drank the occasional glass of wine. And that's the kind of Islam that they practiced, whereas my parents' generation had been totally secular. And in a way, they were children of, my parents were children of 1968, which is um, a familiar phenomenon whether in Iran or in um, you know, San Francisco or Paris in those years, they, they had this vague idea that they would democratize Iran or achieve something called freedom, and they didn't quite calculate what, it, what freedom would mean under the concept of the guardianship of the Juris Consult, the rule of the, of the cleric, um, or, or what it, how you could have an Islamic Republic as the government came to be formed. So they were sort of naive. Um, but anyway, they tried to shield me from all that. So I grew up, as I said, in this world of you know, Western books and movies and 
uh, alcohol that flowed freely and talk of you know, elevated things and also lots of American type movies uh, and uh, cartoon, Reagan era cartoons from which I picked up you know, English more or less without an American accent as you could, or with an American accent I should say. Um, and then there was the, the, the world that was outside our doors and this was a society that was, that had, was rapidly re-Islamizing itself and Islamic piety was enforced on pain of you know, judicial floggings and amputations in some cases. And in that, I lived in the tension between those two worlds and the sort of hypocrisies that it generated. You know, you could say certain things at home that you couldn't say at school. And I would constantly push the envelope at school, of course. Um, but I did have a childhood belief in God in the way that children, you know, imagine a, a, a bearded man in the sky who would get you the toy that you want or save you from the wages of not having done your homework. I had that kind of a simple childish belief. And as I grew older, even that belief, I lost it because in Iran it was, if you were part of my parents, like I said, milieu of intellectuals and so forth, it was just assumed that you were an atheist, that, that to be an atheist was just what it meant to be you know, intelligent and urbane, whereas religion was for the sort of provincial uh, type masses. Um, still, you know, even at school where the, the, the Islamic theology was, and Quran was part of the school curriculum, I was moved by certain things about Islam, even as my belief was beginning, I was beginning to shed any of my uh, belief. So in Islam, especially the Shiite branch of Islam that uh, it, it prevails in Iran. It is the minority sect within the Islamic world, but Iranians adopted it in the 16th century. In that Shiite sect, there is a kind of rich tradition of martyrology. That the, the, this, here, here's a quick 101. If you don't know the difference between Sunnis and Shiites, maybe in the post 9-11 world everyone learned, but the, the Sunnis believed that the caliphs who succeeded uh, the Prophet Muhammad were the rightful leaders of the Muslim Ummah, the body of Muslims, whereas the Shiites believed that um, it was his immediate blood kin and their children, the 12 uh, Imams that followed from, you know, the related, some brother-in-law, I can't remember exactly, uh, <laughs> the, the family relation. That's how, you know, Islamically serious uh, I, I was. But at any rate, that that's the legitimate line of succession to the prophet. And of these prophets, or these imams that followed the prophet, I should say, one of them, Hussein, has a very moving story because obviously he's surrounded by the caliph at one point, and he only has his 72 followers, whereas there, the, you know, the caliph, the Sunni caliph, has an army of tens of thousands, and they're all massacred by by the caliph's armies, but this idea that um, Hussein, Imam Hussein, had laid down his life for the truth and for his friends. Even as I didn't really believe in the broader structures of the faith and its precepts, there was something extremely moving that even still gives me a kind of goosebumps or a, an emotional reaction, the idea of, of a laying down one's life for something larger than oneself for the truth, as he, as he saw it. And that got seared into me, as I said. But meanwhile, I, became, I did become an atheist uh, at age 13, I mean, meaning declaring myself to be an atheist. And the circumstances were that we, you know, we lived in Tehran, but like many middle class or upper middle class families, for the summers we would vacation on the Caspian Sea, which, you know, geography factoid is not really a sea, it's just a big lake, but it's a convention to call it a sea. Um, it's in the, it's, it divides you know, Iran and the Caucasus. And we would go and, and um, you know, typically stay at a friend's villa or something. Um, on this occasion, uh, we were stopped on the way there, uh, like we were going in a convoy. And my, my parents, I should say, were divorced at this point. But because, like I said, they were kind of liberal bohemians, they had pretended. They'd been, in fact, they'd been divorced for, seven, you know, for six, seven years at this point. But they pretended to be together for my sake, right, to shield me from the blows of their, uh, of their divorce. And so we were in a car, but there was also a third male friend who was actually the driver of the car. And we were stopped at a morality police checkpoint, and the question became, you know, what is the relationship? Is there some illicit relationship between this one woman and the two uh, 
am I an illegitimate child or something like that. So I was interrogated with lights not unlike the ones that are um, on the stage, and this you know, morality police officer asked, you know, uh, 15566, you know, does that number mean anything to you, son? And I was like, no. And he said, well, that's your, supposedly your father's identity card, national identity number, yet you don't know it. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, why would I? Anyway, they let us go after they figured out that I am, in fact, you know, my purported father's son, et cetera. But then we had more trouble at when we got to the beach. Um, you know, the Islamic Republic uh, has these mass, massive public beaches, but at least in those days, I think a lot of these restrictions, by the way, have been relaxed, but in those days when the, re the revolution still had its fervor and fire, they would divide the sea by, with these sort of curtains and creating men, women's separate areas. In my case, uh, you know, we would always find some secluded area where men and women could bathe together, and sure enough, we'd always have, my parents would have moonshine alcohol, and you know, as we were enjoying the beach, suddenly you see this Toyota 4x4, which is the signature vehicle. The dark green Toyota 4x4 is the signature vehicle of Iran's morality police. And they drove up and, you know, the guy gets out. There are two in uniform and one who is uh, not in uniform. And the one who doesn't wear a uniform is typically like the haji and he's the, he's the boss. And he, you know, immediately grabbed the hot water you know, bottle and smelled it and immediately screwed up his face because he knew it was alcohol and started berating my parents and their friends, you know, this, it's, it's almost time for your midday prayers, you know, and yet your breath, you know, smells like a whorehouse. What is this? You know, and, uh, and look at you doing this in front of this child. And he turned to me and said, how old are you? And I don't know why, but I thought that if I said that I was younger than I was, it would sort of um, uh, ameliorate the situation you know, I said I was five. I had, you know, I had like pimples coming out and my voice was breaking. And the whole situation became so um, funny that the, the, the haji got said, okay, well, if you're having such a good time, just give us a little taste. And, and that, means, that means bribe us. So my, you know, all the men immediately pulled the cash out of their wallet and the, the guardians of the nation's virtues were on their merry way. Uh, and, so when I got home that day to the villa, I was, and I had had an argument with my parents or something, I went up to my, the room that I had been assigned and I sort of decided that there is no God. If God is just all this sort of rituals of public hypocrisy, then there is no God. And I am an atheist. And it was a sort of electric moment. I imagined that, you know, but, but maybe, maybe, like if I said these things and even cursed God, like there would be demonic creatures who would sort of crawl up from under the floor and drag you down to, to, the, to a netherworld, and none of that happened. Um, in fact, I was dragged down into a kind of netherworld. It just wasn't like the cartoonish version. Meanwhile, I was very proud now, you know, like every 13-year-old who hits upon the idea that there might not be a god in a religious society, I thought I was the only one who had thought of this revolutionary idea, so I would constantly, in every situation, try to inject my newfound atheism. Part of my boldness had to do with the fact that I knew that my uncle in the United States had applied for a, um, a green card for us. So in a way, I was already on my way out, and I had watched all these American movies and, and cartoons. And by the way, in Iran, especially, again, among my family, it wasn't like the, the R rating didn't mean anything. It was like, if it's a Western film, it's, it must be good. So like I saw The Silence of the Lambs far, far too early. But I sort of imagined America as individualistic, super secular, um, something like the, uh, the Manhattan of taxi driver. And that's what I wanted. That's where I wanted to be. That's where I really belonged. And we had this magical green card coming. And it eventually did. Like I said, my parents were divorced. So I only migrated to the US with uh, my mother. And again, I'm, I had my eyes set on, on decadent Manhattan. And so we ordered a KLM Royal Dutch Airlines flight and it takes off, okay, it makes a one, one leg and gets us to Amsterdam and we fly across the ocean and I was sitting on the plane <clears throat> and I was expecting to see you know, the, the map. I was following the, the flight path map, which back then they would project at the end of the economy class, you know, there was one big monitor. And the plane flew right over where I knew like New York was and landed in a place called Minneapolis-St. Paul. 
I, I didn't stop, okay, but we didn't stop there. We then took another plane. This one landed in a place called Salt Lake City, Utah. Okay? And we didn't stop there. Then my uncle, who had got us the, 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 the family preference visa, visas, aka chain migration, um, picked us up and took us to a town called Eden, Utah. And as you were entered the town, there was a sign and it said, you know, POP 600. Um, so I was now at the heart of Mormon country in northern Utah. And of course, you know, that place at that time still preserved something of what you might say, you know, broadly speaking, a Judeo-Christian Protestant ethos, right? It's Utah, it's a, it's a bizarre type of great awakening religion from the 19th century, but it still has these elements of communitarianism. It's definitely not a secular place. In fact, Mormon seminaries, They've somehow figured out they can legally put the seminary on, almost on school grounds. I never know what the you know, First Amendment elements of this, but it's legal. Um, and beer is capped at 3%. Alcohol is, uh, coffee is crown, you know, frowned upon. And I almost instantly turned my oppositional energies, which had been directed against the, you know, the mullahs of the Islamic Republic, against what I thought of as this vaguely Protestant ethos. And there was no converting to Mormonism. You know, if I had rejected Islam with all of its, especially Shiite Islam with all of its rich iconography and bloody martyrology and the way that it had transmitted um, classical learning to, you know, during the uh, Middle Ages, et cetera, all the, like all the Islamic commentators on Plato, Aristotle, I sure as hell was not going to convert to a religion that taught that you know, the ancient Israelites had come to the Americas, attempted to convert the natives, failed, but left their trials and tribulations on golden tablets, which only in the 19th century, you know, a kind of upstate New York huckster found and translated using golden magical glasses, whatever. Seeing stones, sorry, seeing stones. I was not gonna believe in that, so I, you know, it only buoyed my atheism. Um, I'll speed up the story. From here, the story becomes rather, like I said, more mundane, because you know I, like any precocious, fresh off the boat, 13, 14, 15 year old, I would go to bookstores, and um, I one day ran across a book called titled "Thus Spoke Zarathustra" by Friedrich Nietzsche. I was in the habit of I'd read a lot and I knew a lot of ten dollar words, but I didn't always know how to pronounce them. So people would ask me how you're feeling, and I would say, "Oh, a little melancholic," and here was the cover of Thus Spoke Zarathustra featuring a melancholic looking man with a mustache so long that it covered his, his mouth entirely and I was already hooked without even having read the book. But I did read it um, and I was of course again electrified by Zarathustra's declaration early in the book um, that God is dead. Now all the sort of biblical allusions that are sprinkled throughout Thus Spoke Zarathustra went over my head because I hadn't read the Bible. but um, the idea that God is dead means that human beings are not creatures. Um, they are not subject to some uh, either natural or supernatural order, but they make their own world and they can make, they can make uh, what they want of their lives in a radically free and liberated way. And that was very attractive. But I didn't know what to, um, what to do with this realization that uh, now we're totally unbound and unattached and could do whatever we want because we're no longer creatures, we're no longer subject. Uh, so, but I looked up and I, you know, as one does on, on the internet and I learned, I, and also my mother who's, who's read a lot of this stuff and I noticed that a lot of Nietzsche's 20th century heirs had been, you know, Marxists and communists. So I, more from the prestige of that than anything, I gravitated toward uh, Marxism and I sort of looked up the, only socialist group that didn't seem like it was just a guy in a dank basement in northern Utah. And I found and I said, you know, I'm gonna, I'd like to join. And he was probably completely shocked because no one, no one had ever called him, you know, on this website. And, you know, and then I, I gradually, I, I eventually transferred to the University of Washington in Seattle because this group had its headquarters in Seattle. So that's the political commitment was serious enough. Now, um, I, in Marxism, was not looking for what is actually still in some ways 
useful, right? A picture of what happens after industrialization, the way that society divides sharply into cat class, you know, cat classes that are asset owning and those who are a larger majority of people who can only reproduce themselves by their wages. There's something to that that you, know, you can encounter in Pope Leo XIII's um, Rerum Novarum as well. Uh, the picture of modernity that Pope Leo paints is in some ways pretty similar to the picture that, um, that Marx uh, and Engels paint in the Communist Manifesto. But what, what to do about that, of course, they, have, they diverge on that. But I wasn't interested in that sort of interesting political economic element of, of dialectical materialism. What I was most interested in was the, actually the religious aspect, the idea that history has this inevitable direction um, that, uh, but it's an imminent movement, right? It's not something that happens, you know, from the from above. The apocalypse doesn't come from, you know, a divine uh, force is playing out, but rather we make it ourselves through revolution. That is the romance of Marxism. So in short, what I'm saying is I look, I was looking in Marxism not for its interesting structural elements, which still I think should be paid attention to, but to its more sort of pseudo-spiritual, secular religion aspects. Um, but around the same time, around when I was reading this stuff, um, I did have Mormon roommates at some point, and they left a, we would leave books to try to sort of convert each other. So I would leave them, I would leave, you know, William S. Burroughs' extremely obscene naked, naked lunch, and they would leave, you know, their uh, Bibles, which included their own 19th century editions, but I flipped to the old stuff, and I read in one sitting, at one point, the Gospel of Matthew. And I, what it immediately reminded me of, and something that got seared into my mind, was the same idea that I had encountered in the martyrology of the Shiites, that is, someone who lays down his life for his friends and for the truth. It, it was incredibly moving, and it was all the more moving in this case because by its own terms, which I didn't believe at the time, obviously, but on its own terms, this person had all the power in the world. If he had wanted to, he could summon legions of angels to, you know, kick the butts of his persecutors, but he didn't do that, but rather allowed himself to be degraded and spat upon and humiliated and, and scourged and, and ultimately crucified. This, um, which Pope Benedict calls the great reversal, this, this strange reversal of God becoming weak, weak and vulnerable, was, gave me the same sort of goosebumps that the story of Imam Hussein did. Now, of course, I'd never, at that point, I didn't believe in either of them, but as story, as myth, it touched me in a place that, uh, that no philosophy could, but then I you know, quickly forgot about it. Um, eventually, after college was over, I couldn't, didn't know what to do for a while, and so I learned about this program called Teach for America, which places recent college graduates in underserved communities, uh, in my case, I was sent to the U.S.-Mexico border in, to Brownsville, Texas, which is the southernmost tip of Texas. And I became a special education teacher because I stupidly checked a box that said, yes, I'm willing to be. And now, bear in mind, I had no educational training. This is part of Teach for America's promise and peril that it throws you know, ambitious young people into classrooms and forces them to learn to teach. Um, so like, I went from drinking late into the night and shooting the breeze about Hegel to being responsible for people's special education kids at seven in the morning. And I was 20 years old, by the way. I was not even yet legal because I'd finished college in three years. So not because I was a genius. Just, it was just the way the grades are structured in Iran versus the US meant I weirdly skipped the grade. Um, anyway, uh, but I, I was not a very good teacher. I was, you know, nor a good professional at that point. And I quickly learned, though, that um, in, a, in an American public school, as a teacher, you can, you can get away with a lot if you just talk a big game in faculty meetings. By contrast, I had a friend who was a roommate. He was Israeli-American. We both lived together and taught at the same school through Teach for America, and he was unbelievably conscientious. You know, he would wake up at 4 in the morning, lesson plan, show up at the school early to do early tutoring, greet each of his students with a firm handshake and a look in the eye and set very high expectations. And um, actually he started to get in trouble um, because he wouldn't just pass kids automatically. 
Um, he insisted that they actually learn and come for after school tutoring, et cetera. Um, but meanwhile, here I was, you know, if you just tell the principal in a meeting, just raise your hand and be like, well, yeah, we need to adopt more instructional technologies. Like, the principal's like, that guy is a star. That's, <laughs> that kid, my goodness. Whereas my friend, who was actually working really hard, you know, was coming under parental pressure because they want their kids to move on, et cetera. And, it, and he had had a, a letter of admission to Harvard Law School, and, but he had deferred for two years to do his Teach for America uh, placement. And um, so I would ask him, you know, like, you may get fired. Why, you know, why don't you just, like, how are you going to explain to Harvard Law School that you, you know, got fired from your Teach for America gig? Wouldn't that be terrible? But he would just say, no, I won't pass them because it's not the truth. And at the time, I sort of was like, well, you're crazy. But over time, that insistence on, on truth, on, in this case, it's a banal truth of whether the kid has learned something or not, awakened me to my own conscience, right? I began to compare myself to my roommate and others and felt like I was um, not, not as effective as a professional and not ultimately um, as upright a person as I wanted to be. But then I had to ask, what is that voice inside you that says that there is something higher to reach for, that this um, persistent voice that points you to, uh, to do good and to, then punishes you internally, interiorly, when you fail to do that. Um, I began to see my own conscience, and as I became conscious of my own conscience, and this was a pretty um, uh, unsettling realization or unsettling encounter. Uh, it didn't immediately make me a believer, but eventually it would because I had to ask, what is it? Where, what is the source of this voice that makes you aware of some universal standard of, of right and wrong? Where does that, who placed that in us? I had not read C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity at that point, but I was sort of stumbling toward his moral proof for the existence of God, at the, if you've read uh, Mere Christianity at the beginning, he more or less makes that argument that I seem to have an envelope that tells me right and wrong and who gave me that envelope. And every other human being seems to have it too. And they'll say, hey, that's not fair. And both of them may disagree about what the substance of fairness is, but somehow both of them agree that fairness is something they should aspire to. Um, so I will speed up this story. So I, you know, I began to also you know, read actual histories of the Soviet Union and, and you know, of the Chinese experiment with communism. It sort of horrified me. I began to become something of a small c conservative, um, but that's a different story we didn't, needn't, needn't get into. Um, but you know, eventually I found myself um, working in the, living in the Northeast, um, and I was working at a charter school that typically recruited Teach for America alumni, and I was also working for Teach for America, training their new, you know, recent uh, recruits. I was a sort of summer principal because I had eventually gotten fairly decent at teaching over, this, over those years, and um, it, it, that's slightly exaggerated. I was like, not horrible. Uh, <laughs> um, but, so I was working for Teach for America, and in a way, professionally, I was going from strength to strength. You know, I'm in my early to mid-20s, and life is good, and you seem to get more and more professional jobs. You get a Blackberry, do you remember those? And it was, it was great. But, you know, occasionally, I would, I would make, I, I would sort of drink too much and sort of feel really awful the next day. And on, on one of these occasions, I, was, I had finished teaching for the week, and I was headed to New York for the weekend. Um, as part of this training the others who are the new in incoming class of Teach for America Corps members in New York City. And on my way to New York, I had to drive to um, Boston South Station. Uh, you know, I, I had a car accident. Um, I, it, it, I stopped at a, at a red light and then it turned green and I sort of moved forward. I rolled over my car, but um, I hit a car that was coming the other way and it, it's, Probably the worst, I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemies this moment, which ha seemingly happened in slow motion for me. I noticed that the car that I hit had these letters on the side, and it said P-O-L-I-C-E. And I slammed into it. And 
so it turned out that he was in hot pursuit or something, and you know, you, you're supposed to yield to emergency vehicles even if the light is green, but I was too. Anyway, that turned out to be okay, but the whole weekend was terrible. I was, you know, and my Teach for America bros were like, don't worry, we'll just, you know, drink, drink through this. We did. <laughs> and on Sunday, when I was supposed to go back to, um, to Massachusetts, where, I, like I said, I was working at, that was my full-time job was in Massachusetts, I was sort of circling around, along a four block, around a four block radius around Penn Station, just sort of asking myself, like, you know, what are these oafish moments? You know, why are you like this? And where, when are you going to change? And as it happens, there's a, a Capuchin monastery, bizarrely, right next to um, Penn Station, and you would easily miss it. Uh, it has this very modern facade on one side of the building. On the back is more sort of traditionally a church building, but on the front is very modern. There's this kind of alien looking Jesus out front. And I walked in, uh, Randomly, and this is the most providential part of my story, I walked in uh, in this kind of despondent, hungover state just as uh, one Sunday afternoon mass was about to begin. And um, I remember, you know, parking myself somewhere in the pews and being intensely moved by the story uh, that was being unfolded in liturgical form in the mass. And it was the same idea of um, someone who is all-powerful, uh, undergoing this gr great reversal where he's punished for my sake. And this is uh, moving uh, beyond words. I try to put it into words in a book called uh, From Fire by Water. My kids appreciate your $2 contribution to their college fund. <laughs> um, but I, I, you know, looking at the, at the altar, I felt, and that silence and that declaration on the night he was betrayed, just sent me into uh, a rapture of tears. And what I felt was that there was something very holy radiating up there, and that it, I, sh I don't belong there because I'm very abject, and yet it was also radiating for me. That's about what I took away. I didn't know much about Catholic theology, of course, of what actually takes place at the Mass. It was at the mostly at the level of, uh, of emotion and imagination. Other than that, my only encounters with Catholicism had to do, of course, my mother was an artist, so I knew something about the church's sacred art tradition. I had this vague sense that Catholicism is the most prestigious branch of Christianity because it's the oldest, you know, continuous one. And I had seen, you know, the baptism scene in The Godfather, you know, Pater Noster, Quies in Celis, shoot your enemy in the eye. That was about it. So, but then as I was, as I was walking out, I, um, stopped in the vestibule of the church. You know, I had composed myself so I didn't look like a blubbering idiot, you know, and the, all, the, all the other parishioners and attendees had walked out and shook the, the friar's hand. So it was just me and I sort of went up and looked at a picture of the reigning pontiff, which typically hangs in, a, in the vestibule of a church, as you well know. And looking at, at the time, Pope Benedict, that also sent me to another rapture of tears and the friar must have known that I was a little bit um, in a weird place, so he came up to me, but he said the most obnoxious thing. He said, uh, you know, son, that's not God. <laughs> I, I know, I know. That's and, and, you know, I just sort of couldn't answer him, and I, and I walked out. Um, and that was it. That was... But over time, I began to read... Um, I then started to read uh, more and more by then, you know, after this Teach for America stint and my whole misbegotten adventure in becoming a school teacher. I went to law school. I never became a lawyer. I went to work for the Wall Street Journal editorial page and then was soon shipped to London to run the European edition, help run the European edition of the Wall Street Journal, which no longer exists. It's now been all as one global edition. But at the time, there was something called Wall Street Journal Europe. And, you know, again, like, life is very good. I seem to be going from, from strength to strength. But now the questions that still gnaw at me are there. And I find them sometimes confronted to me by others, where people ask, you know, what do you believe uh, religiously? And often, including in the job interview for the journal, um, or among, in parties and so forth. And interiorly, I was be becoming just aware that I had that I'd been blessed with this gift of faith. Um, but I was ashamed to 
own it because I thought that, remember, religion is for sort of provincial saps. And so I would say things like, you know, I, this stuff is very beautiful, you know, it's, 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 it's been a civilizing influence on the world, hasn't it? Like Caravaggio is lovely. Um, but interiorly, I was starting to believe, uh, to my own shock. I then picked up uh, a book called uh, Jesus of Nazareth. It was a trilogy, uh, kind of, I picked it up coinciding around that time or a little after Pope Benedict's visit to the, to the United States. And it's his attempt, as he puts it, to discover the face of the Lord himself. And it's this magnificent work of scriptural theology. As, a, as for starters, what it did for me was utterly humble me because I had always this idea that um, ideas that are newest are best. And so like that, you know, Plato might have been interesting 2,500 years ago and Christianity might have made it some contributions 500 years later roughly, you know, and then da 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 And then what comes later and ever more chronologically uh, forward to our own time must be most correct or must be most true. Um, and the people who still cling to older ideas must be, you know, backward. And then I, you read uh, Pope Benedict and the sort of the sheer learning, his engagement with modern philosophy, et cetera, humbles you. you and this is a, it is going to sound like a stupid thing to say, and it is a stupid thing to say, but I was kind of stupid then, was that I was like, oh, religion isn't just for like, you know, the needy and the weak and the provincial and the like really, you know, you can be intelligent and believe. That was all, you know, I sort of took away from it. Well, not all. The other was he began to explain that the, 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 the two big books of the Bible, the, the Hebrew Bible and the, and the New Testament, actually tell one cohesive story. And in fact, in a way that the, the, the Old Testament doesn't make sense unless it's fulfilled in, um, in the New. That... And that story is ultimately God's ever deeper disclosure of himself in that great reversal that I had found so moving, right? The, um, first, in, 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 in encountering a shadow of it in Shiite Islam, then encountering it in the Gospel of Matthew, and then ultimately at these occasional moments when I would go to the Mass in points of crisis in life, that's the story of the Bible, is God drawing ever near and humbling himself for abject humanity. So... Uh, that was very powerful. I, and simultaneously, I started reading this very beautiful translation of the Torah by Robert Alter. And I would, I, I began in a way that's very hard to explain to hear in, in the story of the fall, for example, and that sort of transgression in the Bible and what followed it. Uh, a, the most coherent account of the brokenness both in me and the brokenness I witnessed in the world outside, and I, uh, I, I heard this voice already. I had heard this voice throughout my life. Uh, you know, what have you done? What have you done? Your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. I, was, I hadn't murdered anyone, but the, the idea that um, there is this voice inside you, again, this conscience that tells you, that points you to a universal law, and then therefore indicts you, I had already encountered and so to hear in the Bible or to read it in the Torah was quite powerful. And uh, I could say that at that point I began to, to be a believer and not to be ashamed to say that I'm some sort of believer. Meanwhile, you know, the, the journal has shipped me off to London and I was to explore, uh, among other things around then, was the 2015-16 European migrant crisis. And I embedded with a group of migrants, even living in... Um, Istanbul in a migrant safe house, because I spoke Persian and I was uh, a native Iranian, I could pretend to be an actual migrant. And so I did this very foolish thing. It was like, by the way, around that point I had gotten married. I don't get into that story, but it was the last time I told my wife, I'm going to do something really crazy and, you know, bear with me. I'm going to buy a life jacket in London, a nice one, not the kind that the migrants actually use, put it in my backpack, join a migrant I had met on Facebook, he was coming from Iran, he was a real migrant. I was actually flying into Istanbul and I would pretend to be his you know, relative or friend and we would go through the process of, as you remember, the path of the migrants. They go through um, uh, Western's Turkey, uh, uh, sorry, Turkey's Western shore, you know, through the Aegean Sea up to Greece and then walk all the way. And I did this journey not in a straightforward way but th through these kind of reporting trips, I sort of did the whole thing. And 
the migrant safe house was basically, I got a foretaste of hell. And not only because there were like cockroaches everywhere all the time, like hundreds of cockroaches that you, you know, on your food and everything, but also the violence that broke out among the migrants. I, I'm not making a policy argument here. I happen to have my views of what should have done, been done around the migrant crisis. Um, but just that it was a picture of, a, an external picture of my own sense of internal abjection, such that when I got back to London, you know, I wanted to write up this story, obviously journalistically, but I also immediately thought I need to become a, I need to join a church. I need to, I need God. Um, and at the time I had this friend who was a, an evangelical Anglican who advocated for persecuted Christians in the Middle East, so we were good friends, and, and uh, he was a source for me as a journalist, et cetera, and he said, um, you know, go to this church called Holy Trinity Brompton, which is uh, probably the most prestigious, powerful institution, uh, evangelical institution in Britain, a kind of rock star church with rock star status, and I did, I did go for a while, um, but ultimately, I was left somewhat dissatisfied. And the strange thing is that although there was a lot, a lot of um, outward emotion and singing and dancing and stuff, that was in a way I was like I was into it. I wasn't that snobbish. In some ways, I tried to get into it. Ultimately, it was actually very, very abstract. Right? All you have is the Bible and and the written word, and there's there are no other points of contact between man and God and in that kind of evangelicalism. But as it happens. Right next door to Holy Trinity Brompton is another church called the London Oratory, which I would walk by all the time. And one day I noticed they had said, you know, solemn, solemn mass at 11 a.m. And already having gone through the evangelical service, I then walked into this very, uh, this neo-Baroque church and went through a mass, which was in Latin, although I did not know the distinction between the two forms, this was actually just a, the new mass, just done in very, very, it was done in Latin and very reverent. And all the impressions and powerful sources of uh, sort of divine imp inspiration in the imagination, political thinking, philosophical thinking, um, but also, like I said, emotion, imagination, all these threads came together at the mass, both the moving element of what happens, the sacrifice up there, what happens on the altar, but then also the sense of continuity, authority, order, millennial institution that the Catholic Church represents, the perfect, as I call it, the sort of perfect harmony between grace and order is Catholicism for me, grace and order together. And such that by the end of that mass, I decided to become a Roman Catholic, like right away. And I went to the oratory house, which is basically the, where the priests live and so forth, and I knocked on the door and this, wizened old English priest with wire rim glasses opened the door. He had the most posh accent, which I won't imitate, but he was sort of just like, well, how can I help you? And I said, I want to become a Roman Catholic. And he, he didn't miss a beat. He said, very well, I shall instruct you. And uh, <laughs> we, we, we would meet once a day, oh, sorry, once a week, every Sunday. Oh, thank you. We would meet, you know, once a Sunday, and it was really wonderful, uh, just an hour of conversation. And then I was received into the church on December 19, 2016, the day I won't forget. And, oh, thank you. Oh, please, please, please don't clap for me at that point. It's not my, it's not my achievement, believe me. And, uh, uh, you know, I haven't sinned ever since. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.